welcome to your finance TV. We're here with Jeffrey Hughes, founder of Alpha Insights. Jeff published his weekly playbook on Sunday night, which is available on Substack at hugeinsights.substack.com. Jeff, welcome back, sir. Hey, great to be here as usual, Matty. So uh, thank you for all your support. And I want to remind you again, don't forget to subscribe and like. We're uh, edging up on 4,000 subscribers or maybe through it at this point. Maybe we are. So hopefully we are as, uh, as we go to publish. But it's been quite a week. It's, uh, you know, volumes have been quite dire. The S&P is up a couple of percent since uh, in the last week or so. Uh, we wrapped up Jackson Hole, had a week of jolts, jobs, job openings number this morning. Thursday, we have uh, USPCE to look forward to and Friday, the jobs number. But, uh, you know, enough of me. There's not much for me to talk about, but we're here to talk about you, Jeff. Talk us down from your uh, top down, as usual, sir. Sure. Uh, you know, last week we saw the S&P close up about uh, 80 basis points or so. Um, you know, probably a disappointment for the bulls who I think were, you know, kind of preparing for a blowout number from NVIDIA, which they got wholeheartedly. The stock reacted in advance, popped 50 points, sold off, uh, ended closing the day uh, following the earnings report, which came out last Wednesday after the close. Uh, essentially unchanged, up just maybe like 10 basis points or something. But I think that was a bit of a disappointment. Uh, the subsequent day, it traded down. And so, you know, we've seen uh, NVIDIA really give back uh, most of those, um, you know, historic gains uh, to 500 and, and kind of, you know, below where it was prior to the earnings report. So uh, despite, you know, putting up a blowout number and blowout guidance, um, you know, it seems like the AI hype cycle has kind of reached its pinnacle at this point. Jackson Hole, I think, was kind of a non-event, uh, more or less a yawn. I think the, the market reacted favorably to it because there were no negative surprises, right? And, and none were expected. We expected Powell to kind of just kind of stay the course and not say anything radical. Uh, this week, we have PCE to look forward to. I think that's going to be an important number. As, as you know, the headline CPI number has come down quite a bit, and, and we're seeing the bulls lean on that heavily. Um, however, the PCE number has been stubbornly uh, high. It's remained sticky, double the Fed's target of 2% right now. I think it's 4.1%. Uh, the expectation is that it comes in slightly above that at 42 on an annualized basis. And so and I think that's going to be an issue. And then, of course, Friday's jobs number, uh, it's anybody's guess at this point. Uh, the one thing that I think is especially interesting right now is the degree to which the federal government is running a deficit, an historic deficit in absolute dollar terms. And, you know, one of the top five in, in percentage terms in history, yet we are at full employment. Uh, it really defies logic, in our opinion, and, and could potentially be a setup for a major, major problem uh, in the economy and the markets on a go forward basis. We continue to suspect that, you know, this, this restrictive environment and monetary policy will result in a recession. Uh, we expect that recession will evolve over the balance of this quarter and, and basically uh, reveal itself in the fourth quarter. And I don't think it will leave the scene of the crime uh, probably for uh, the subsequent nine to 12 months. So I think it's going to be a long recession uh, based on a lot of the data that we look at. Uh, with respect to the market, um, you pointed out earlier, you know, the S&P's kind of been um, dribbling up and down here a couple of percent or so in the last week. Uh, we think uh, really the way to view it is this, um, you know, we saw a a you know bear market decline in 2022 that stopped on October 13th. Uh, we saw a counter trend advance off of that October 13th low that rallied into the uh, the July 27th high about a month ago or so, and um, we, we kind of called that to the penny. Uh, and from that point, we've seen the market decline in five waves. We're calling that uh, minor wave one down. We think we're in a counter trend advance from that now. And we think the S&P will terminate that counter trend advance if it hasn't already and roll over uh, in minor wave three, which will be part of primary wave three down, which we think will be um, a doozy to say the least. We think, uh, you know, with uh, September uh, upon us and, and October to follow and the cycle composite all pointing in a, a downward sort of trajectory for the next three months or so, 
we think that gives the the market cover uh, to uh, basically retrace much of the gains that we've seen, if not all of them, uh, before uh, that that period is over. So um, with that, we continue to advise clients to you know kind of sit on the sidelines, remain patient, collect your five percent in T bills, and uh, you know let other people play this volatility and lose their money. Uh, the you know it's not a fat pitch. The odds are not in your favor right now. You're better to bet big when the odds are in your favor, and they're not right now. And so you know um, it has been our view that with that hedge funds should minimize net equity exposure, and individual investors and long only investors uh, should consider maximizing their cash uh, exposure at this point or cash reserves rather. So Jeff, uh, you definitely touched on it in your opening statement, uh, but as you know, we're coming up to month end here and nudging up on September, and and you know you, you throw out the title, prepare for a September to remember. So uh, you know, I don't think you mean that in a good way. So how how do you how, how do equities normally perform in September historically, and then what are your thoughts about going into this this September? Well, unequivocally, <laughs> unequivocally. Uh, September is the worst month for equities, period, okay, bar none. Um, the median return for the S&P is down 1.56, looking at data back to 1928. For the NASDAQ, uh, it's down 1.21%, looking at data back to 1985. So, um, you know, those are the facts, right? Um, the other fact that is probably you know, lesser known is the fact that it tends to be front end loaded. In other words, um, September tends to see its largest decline from about September 2nd through September 14th. And then it actually goes up, but it remains the worst month. So what we should expect in the first half of September is a very deep decline and a possible recovery of that decline toward the end of the month or partial recovery of that decline toward the end of the month. But I think uh, the setup is, is particularly bearish at this point and ominous. And I would prepare for September to remember. Uh, and, and what you should remember is to sit on the sidelines and hold above average levels of cash uh, during the first two weeks or so. So let's talk about realized volatility. Uh, it looks like we've certainly had a spike. And do you feel this is you know onwards and upwards? Possibly. Um, our vol has been trending lower really for the last year, okay? Uh, but for only about the second time this year, we've seen one month realized volatility uh, now higher than three month realized volatility. And uh, the thing is, I mean, um, this the front month, the, the one month RVOL window has really kind of become a toggle uh, for equity exposure among systematic traders, right? And so typically when we see the one month exceed the three month realized volatility level, that leads to an increase in notional rebalancing flows, um, you know, from these systematic traders. And so, you know, our expectation is that number one, it's already begun. We've seen this happen. You can take a look at uh, the data, and it shows that a lot of these systematic uh, uh, trading firms have reduced equity exposure. The question is, is if realized volatility at the one-month time window uh, starts to accelerate higher relative to three months realized volatility, we could see that that rebalancing fund flows turn into a wholesale selling condition. And if we do see that, uh, and I honestly expect that uh, to occur beginning in the first couple of weeks of September, uh, it could it could result in a pretty significant flush to the downside. So, Jeff, you've been bullish on the US dollar uh, for several months now, on and off, and you've kind of been calling this really well. It seems to be moving higher here again as well. Do you think onwards and upwards in this one? I like onwards <laughs> well, and upwards, yeah. <laughs> I do. And uh, I'll tell you why. You know, number one, the US dollar has a pretty visible negative correlation to the S&P 500. Our view is that, you know, if, if, you, if you pose the question, and it has been posed to me this way, is that the dollar that is driving the stock market or is the stock market that's driving the dollar. And I think it's the former, right? I think it's it's the US dollar, the big changes in the US dollar, those swings drive the stock market, right? And, and the point is that uh, the US dollar has um, penetrated its short-term downtrend line so far. Uh, and we've seen a pretty big move up from around 99.41, which was the cycle low here, 
up to around 104 and change. And we're running close to, uh, you know, challenging that key resistance level at 104.61. I think if we do get uh, a, a breach above that, a penetration above that 104.61, a breakout that's sustained there could see uh, the U.S. dollar rally upwards to about 109.80, call it 110, just in round numbers. And um, what what does that mean for the equity markets? Well, the move so far up from that that cycle low at about 99.41 to the recent highs of say 104 and a quarter or 104 and change has resulted in a 272 point decline in the S&P 500 from its July 27th peak down to the August 18th lows. I, I suspect that if we get the breakout in the US dollar and a rally to 110, we could see something far worse in terms of downside uh, you know, potential for uh, equities. That's very interesting. We were last at the 110 level around what, last November uh, 2022. So, and it's not far. We could get there pretty easily. So looking at the technicals of the broader market, have we seen any recent changes or are things still lining up for a pretty bearish turn of events? In our view, uh, they are perfectly aligned for a bearish uh, setup. And in fact, we're looking for a primary wave three decline. Uh, we think it began on uh, July 27th, but just you know, setting the way back machine to January 4th, 2022, we can see that that decline into the October 13th low traced out five waves in, in a rare pattern known as an expanding uh, diagonal. Uh, it's a it's a leading diagonal of the expanding variety in Elliott Wave uh, parlance, and uh, it does have one flaw. Wave five fell short of its expected, uh, uh, you know, uh, a termination point. That terminal point would normally ex be expected to be much lower, and, and we think a news event around the inflation data is really what caused it to fall short and rally off that level uh, on uh, October 13th last year. Now, from that point. Uh, we saw an initial five wave advance, which we're counting as intermediate wave A of primary wave two up. Following that initial advance into the December highs, we saw a three wave flat wave corrective uh, form, which we're counting as uh, intermediate wave B. And from that March 13th low, uh, where intermediate wave B bottomed, we saw a five wave advance that, that got a little convoluted. We saw two expansions uh, that are unusual. I guess they're not unusual in the sense that the fifth wave expanded, and that's typical in wave C when it's a terminal wave form, and, and we expect that that was, but we also saw the fifth of the fifth uh, see an expansion as well. So these subdivisions made identifying the terminal point of this counter trend advance somewhat elusive. That being said, we think uh, we've solved the Rubik's Cube at this point. We think that, you know, uh, technically speaking, uh, primary wave two topped on July 27th. And the reversal that we've seen off of that July 27th high, uh, as I mentioned earlier, traced out five waves down. We are labeling that minor wave one down. Uh, we believe the advance off of that uh, August 18th low is uh, minor wave two up. It is currently in progress. It may have terminated. Uh, we we're, uh, you know, Running with the assumption on Friday uh, at Friday's close that you know the high that we saw uh, was already you know I think it tagged the the 50 day moving average we think it already may have uh, terminated minor wave two up but now uh, yesterday's price action leads us to believe that and the follow through today leads us to believe that it's highly probable that this is an ABC pattern uh, that is uh, completing it. So it's retraced now the 50% retracement to the penny. We think that's probably terminated uh, wave two. And if not, probably has a little more to go to maybe the 618 retracement at best. But that being said, once it is complete and once we take out uh, the uh, minor wave B low, uh, we can definitively say that minor wave three down, uh, I, I'm sorry, uh, the minor wave one low, we can definitively say that the minor wave three decline is is now in progress and once it's complete you know we'll see a wave four and a wave five before we terminate intermediate wave one down of primary wave three down what this is all leading to is the simple fact that 
you know, this is going to be a long drawn out process. I think the biggest problem traders have is they've been very impatient. They want to see immediate results. They want the market to deliver on, you know, their expectations instantly. And the fact of the matter is the market is going to fight this all the way down, right? It's just not going to take this sitting down. And so the decline is going to be one that's drawn out. It's going to shake a lot of people out of the market. Uh, and then draw a lot of people back in at every counter trend advance until we get down to uh, the, the the levels that probably will mark uh, the end of primary wave three down. And we're thinking somewhere in the mid 2000s, uh, say call it 2750 at the high end, maybe 2400 or so at the low end. Um, those are our working hypothesis at this point. But, uh, you know, this the next real move, the move that we're working on right now should carry the S&P to about 4,050 once we take out those uh, those August 18th lows. And the way we get there is that uh, classic chartists could notice a, a uh, classic pattern top formation of the head and shoulders variety that's developing. And we're putting in, you know, the upper bound of the right shoulder right now. We think a breakdown below that August 18th would count to 4,050 on the S&P. That would take out a number of chart support levels, would take out a number of trend lines, would take out the 200-day moving average, it would take out gap support levels and carry us right down into that 2,000, I'm sorry, that 4,050 level before most likely intermediate wave one down terminates. And so that's kind of our working hypothesis right now, Mehdi. All right, so 4,050, you see, is the first kind of level down. Um, Jeff, how are the S&P internals looking? Internals continue to remain weak. Um, I would say that the, the, the key observation is that there are negative divergences across breadth, momentum, and net advancing volume that have yet to be resolved. Um, I would say that... Uh, uh, momentum, and we use the, the five-week RSI oscillator as our intermediate-term momentum gauge, uh, is currently below the median line, which implies a, a bearish momentum regime. Uh, and then I would also say that net advancing volume is, has been particularly weak. We got down to a sub one-to-one -one level on the five-week moving average of the up-down volume ratio. Uh, it closed last week at 1.44 to one, but as, as we've said many times, anything that's below, say, five to one is pretty weak to begin with. Um, you know, you don't get a bull market advance unless you're at five to one or greater on net advancing volume. Uh, any sort of a sustained advance, that is. Um, I think that this is indicative of a counter trend advance. And that's where we're at in the count minor wave two counter trend advance. And so the, the less than two to one uh, net advancing volume figures that, that exist for the last five weeks are pretty consistent with that. And Jeff, is investor sentiment coming off? <laughs> yes, uh, it is collapsing, Mehdi. In fact, uh, professional investors have been uh, have, have, have wasted no time uh, going from a leveraged position of 101.8% net long to now, uh, I believe, 34.4%. Uh, that's just in a month, right? They have basically headed for the exits. Uh, these are tactical investment managers and asset allocators. Um, they don't necessarily represent the average long only investor, uh, you know, like a mutual fund manager who's running like, you know, the Fidelity Growth Fund or something. He's got to be invested at least 95%. Um, but the other way that we look at uh, sentiment is by looking at the individual investors and uh, the AAII um, sentiment gauge, which is a survey that looks at uh, what you know this this notoriously bearish cohort you know has positioned themselves around. And and what we see now is that the, the bull bear spread that's bulls minus bears has now moved negative again. Uh, just a week ago, uh, it was positive nineteen point two percent. Uh, down from around 30%, which was the peak. Now it is uh, negative 3.6%. So that's a big round trip in a fairly short period of time for individual investor sentiment. We've seen a downtick in the Michigan Consumer Sentiment Index. Uh, we would also point out that uh, uh, investment advisor sentiment, P 
peaked back around mid-July as well at around 57% bulls. Uh, that is now pulled back into the uh, high 40s, I believe around 47, 48% bulls for investment advisors. The thing that's interest me, in, interesting to me about the investment advisor data, and this comes from investors intelligence, is that the professional advisors that are bearish are still hovering around 18%. That is the lowest we've seen since the market peaked back in uh, late 21, uh, early 22. In fact, uh, it, it coincided perfectly with the NASDAQ complex peaking in November of 2021. And um, at that time, we saw um, uh, investment professional advisors that had turned bearish. That was about 18.3%. So now we're down around 18% below that level, and the market never even made a new high. So this is a particularly bearish setup. It tends to coincide with big uh, trend reversals in the major indexes. Oh, definitely uh, use that as an indicator. So I know you touched on NVIDIA in your opening statements, but uh, you know we have to, I guess, go look at the Magnificent Seven. So what are your thoughts on uh, on them right now? Well, I, the big surprise was the fact that NVIDIA was not the leader last week within that cohort of the, the Magnificent Seven. It was Tesla. Tesla was up 10.7%. Uh, and um, it, it was NVIDIA came in second, up 6.3%. The other five constituents in that group uh, averaged up around 2% or so. And the equal weight S&P 500 ended unch, right? I think I mentioned earlier, the cap weight was up uh, 80 basis points. So, you know, we saw a big revival in interest in these names and, and not unexpectedly given, uh, you know, the positive sentiment uh, building up into the NVIDIA quarter. So, Jeff, as we wrap things up, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on a sector basis. So are there any sectors of note that you want to discuss? And then obviously we can go through some of your valuation analysis and uh, relative strength uh, rotational thoughts. Yeah. So uh, first, let's just recap last week. You know, tech popped and uh, energy dropped. That was the first uh, we've seen uh, of that relationship in about three weeks. It had been energy as the leader the last three weeks, more or less. And uh, tech suddenly, and tech had been, you know, underperforming, if not the loser, uh, a number of those weeks. And and here, tech was up about 2.3 percent. Energy was off about 1.4 percent last week, giving back, you know, the gains, you know, a small portion of the gains that it has accrued over the past month. Uh, with respect to sector rotation and value, well, with respect to valuation, energy continues to trade cheap amongst all the groups on a forward PE basis. And, um, you know, from my perspective, you know, it makes sense to allocate capital to um, undervalued sectors and, and energy stands out as it's trading at about a 50% discount to the market. The flip side of that is tech. Tech continues to trade at a 50% premium to the market, uh, despite the fact that it's pulled back so much, you know. Um, and, and we actually continue to suggest that um, investors will do well to fade the Magnificent Seven. Uh, we've even go and gone as far as to say, go long equal weight S&P, short cap weight S&P to de-emphasize that exposure and, uh, and, and basically give yourself kind of a market neutral exposure to, uh, to stocks as a way to kind of to play that. Um, I think, uh, you know, Right now, if, I, if I'm taking a look at individual sectors on a uh, rotational basis, the way I want to position is long industrials, long energy, long materials, okay? Um, I want to be fading the rally in financials and REITs. I want to be uh, deeply underweight tech, discretionary, and calm. And, um, you know, I wouldn't mind starting to uh, overweight some of the defensive sectors, especially healthcare. I think you can overweight healthcare. And uh, with respect to staples and utilities, which have been you know, pretty, pretty big underperformers for the last several months, I think now is the time to at least be equal weight and be watching those closely for a possible overweight in the weeks and months ahead. That's fantastic. Really appreciate your thoughts. As always, Jeff, thank you for sharing them with us. 
Um, I also want to urge our viewers don't forget to check out Jeff's content on Substack and huge on Substack at hugeinsights.substack.com. Jeff, thank you so much for your time. Always a pleasure, Maddie. And just one last plug. Uh, we will publish our, uh, September, our September newsletter on Saturday, September 2nd. So get yourself on the, uh, on the distribution list by subscribing and putting your email in there, and you'll get an opportunity to review our, uh, our uh, uh, economic case in detail. Fantastic. I'm looking forward to that. It's always a fantastic read. Until next time, thank you for watching, and good luck investing.